This is Dr. Veena Venkatesh from Ajanta Pharma Limited, Mumbai. It's, uh, today's uh, digital dialogue would be Prepared Lenite with Modli Boast, a perfect partner in PPG and diabetes management. So, uh, I, on the behalf of Ajanta Pharma, I welcome all the delegates and I welcome Dr. Sujil Ghosh for this digital dialogue. You know that Ajanta Pharma is one of the fastest growing pharma companies with a research orientation and has got much first in India molecules in the market. Today for uh, Digital Dialogue we have with us Dr. Sujay Ghosh. I am very honored to introduce him to the audience. Dr. Sujay Ghosh is a DM endocrinology and a lot of fellowships like FRCT <coughs> from London, Glasgow, Edinburgh and FACE. Specialty Certificate in Endocrinology and Diabetes from UK. He is a Professor of Endocrinology at Kolkata. He is the Editor-in-Chief Oxford Handbook Series, Southeast Asia edition. He is an Executive Editor, Thyroid Research and Practice, Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism. He has been an International Advisory Board Member, several awards uh, in his credit, including a Best Research Paper Award from Bone Metabolism at European Endocrine Society, at Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, Jatsu. He has published over two, 250 articles and contributed to chapters in the books. And he is the co-author of five books. So he has been an eminent endocrinologist from Kolkata. With this a very brief introduction of Sir, I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Sujai Ghosh. Over to you, sir. And request for all the delegates to please put the question in the chat box and it will be addressed once the talk is over. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, a big thank you to Dr. Veena for that kind introduction and a big thank you to Ajanta Pharma for having given me this wonderful opportunity to interact with this lovely audience. And uh, as Dr. Veena has mentioned, I'm going to talk about the partnership between Repoglinide and Voglibos and how a fixed drug combination of these two molecules can help us control postprandial hyperglycemia and help in the management of type 2 diabetes. So today, I the, my talk, I've kind of divided into certain subsections, as you can see here. I'm not going to go into the individual sections here right away, but go forward with the talk. The first bit, of course, you and I, we are talking about a pandemic of COVID-19, but a much, much bigger pandemic which started almost two decades ago and which, which probably is going to be much more detrimental than COVID, which probably does not get the same kind of attention because, you know, it's only been about four years, four and a half years that India does now have a national non-communicable disease program in terms of healthcare policies. And uh, that too is very, very inadequate. I hope at least now people in India realize the importance of health and the governments realize the importance of health and spend more money on health. At least 10% of GDP has to be spent on health. And in, in developed nations, 10% of all health spending is on diabetes only. And it's not surprising, therefore, in India that we have over six, seven crore people with diabetes. And probably that's a gross underestimation of the problem itself. And in India, as you can see, 7.7 .7 crore people and with a prevalence of around 9%, I think that's somewhere actually around 13% rather than 9%. So very soon we will overtake China in terms of the number of people with diabetes. Now, when we talk about glucose control, conventionally, until say the 1990s, the blood glucose parameters that were used for control was fasting and postprandial glucose, in which even the fasting got more preference rather than the postprandial glucose. That's prior to the UKPDA study. Then the American Diabetes Association in 1992 added HbA1c to it as an additional parameter in addition to fasting and postprandial glucose. And of course, we are also concerned about avoiding hypoglycemia. 
we talk about glycemic variability and in the last one and a half years we are talking about time in range in terms of the amount of time that the blood glucose remains in the range that you want and you're avoiding hypos as well as hyperglycemia. So our concentration predominantly will be on postprandial glucose and I'll tell you why as we go along. So if you look at normal insulin secretion and what happens in type 2 diabetes in terms of beta cell dysfunction, the first thing that goes wrong in terms of beta cell function is there is a loss of the first phase of insulin secretion. And it's the second phase of insulin secretion, which is usually aggravated in the early phases of type 2 diabetes to overcome or compensate for number one, the loss of the first phase of insulin secretion, and second, to overcome insulin resistance. This is important to understand the pathophysiology of postprandial hyperglycemia. So the first phase of insulin secretion is lost first, and it contributes to postprandial hyperglycemia. So when you're taking a meal, immediately you need some amount of insulin to normalize postprandial hyperglycemia and you need something else in the second phase where you would have normally had a sustained insulin secretion to control postprandial hyperglycemia. So you can understand there are two components in the management of postprandial hyperglycemia. The first, a beta cell secretory or insulin secretory function and the second, something to do so that you can flatten the second phase of hyperglycemia. So if you look at you know, the meal pattern of a normal, say even an Indian, you know, even though we are having say three meals a day or maybe four meals a day, because the meal stays in the body for quite some time, if you look at overall, a significant proportion of the time of the day is actually spent in the postprandial state rather than the fasting state. As you can see, the yellowish bit is probably the time when you are actually truly fasting. The rest of the times you have some amount of postprandial state. So at least a significant proportion of the day is spent in the postprandial state. And it's important to realize that HbA1c lowering below certain levels. For example, once you've come down to close to near normal levels, it's very difficult to lower HbA1c beyond that. But as you have seen with the DCCT and the UKPDS trial, even 1% HbA1c reduction leads to significant reduction of complications. So particularly when you're closer to targets, management of postprandial hyperglycemia, which is so difficult, becomes even more important in the management of type 2 diabetes. Going back to a, another study, the START study, which was conducted in several sites, including my institute where Professor Shwetinath Mukhopadhyay was the primary investigator. Shashank Joshi was the PI of this entire study, which got published in BMJ Open. You know, one of the things that you realize is at least two third of Indian diet comprises of carbohydrates, wherever you are in India, north, south, east, west. So we realize management of this carbohydrate load is significantly important in Indians. The Americans and the Europeans, they do not consume so much of carbohydrates and that's probably one of the reasons why none of their guidelines have anything to do with AGIs. The alpha glucosidase inhibitors are therefore significantly more important in the Indian population. And what we also understand is not only do we consume a lot of carbohydrate, that is about two third of the meal is carbohydrate. Two third of Indians actually have uncontrolled postprandial hyperglycemia. So two major take home from that particular trial. Then if you look at other studies, you will find that at least two third of Indians do not achieve good glycemic control. It's probably about 75% of Indians have poor glycemic control. And amongst the ones who have poor glycemic control, you can see about Two third have a HbA1c between seven and eight. That means they are not well controlled, but it's not that terribly badly controlled. They are very close to the target, so they need something which will lower their targets to the range that you want safely, and thereabouts comes the importance of postprandial hyperglycemia as well. So, a few questions that we need to answer as clinicians is: Is postprandial hyperglycemia important at all? Why? Because Prior to UKPDS, we did not even know that postprandial hyperglycemia was important. And why is it important to control? What are the currently available therapies? And what are their limitations? And what is the key solutions 
as clinicians. So the fact that postprandial hyperglycemia is harmful is clearly established in several studies, including studies from India and studies from the rest of the world, which shows that postprandial hyperglycemia is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular complications. And therefore, as you can see, the IDF clearly recommends that postprandial hyperglycemia is harmful and should be addressed. In terms of the importance of postprandial hyperglycemia, it increases oxidative stress and increases complications related to type 2 diabetes. And like I was saying, if you look at, for example, the DECODE study and the several other studies world over, there's a very strong association between postprandial hyperglycemia and cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. And if you look at the main pathophysiologic mechanisms through which all of this happens, you can see there's hypertension, inflammation, prothrombotic state, oxidative stress, and endothelial dysfunction. And if you're talking about the relationship of postprandial hyperglycemia with microvascular complications, you can see that there is some correlationship, but probably what is more important is postprandial hyperglycemia has greater correlationship with macrovascular complications. And like I was saying, UKPD has first told us the importance of this control of glucose. Now, this is Monier's paper, a seminal paper published in Diabetes Care, which kind of tries to show that the closer you are to target, that means the lower the HbA1c, the greater is the contribution of postprandial glucose compared to fasting. As you can see in the graph, when you're looking at levels less than 7.3, the darker shade is the contribution of postprandial hyperglycemia and the lighter shade is the contribution of fasting glucose. Now, I, couldn't, I misplaced a slide, I couldn't find it. There are three studies, including one from Japan, one from Vietnam and one from Korea. All Asian countries where the predominant dietary intake is carbohydrate. In those studies, the contribution of the postprandial glucose to HbA1c is even greater and remains so not just at low levels of HbA1c, but even at higher levels of HbA1c, telling that the Indian population, high HbA1c, the contribution of postprandial hyperglycemia is much, much more than that it is in the Western world. So as you can see, I was telling you in type 2 diabetes, the first thing that goes wrong is the loss of the first phase of insulin secretion and that leads to hyperglycemia. And therefore, not surprisingly, you can see that the blood glucose, if you are looking at both the fasting and the post meals, it's probably the post meal glucose level that rises even before the fasting glucose level rises above the thresholds of diagnosis of diabetes. And most of the patients with pre-diabetes would probably have postprandial hyperglycemia rather than fasting hyperglycemia. And you and I are aware of the so-called ticking clock hypothesis, which tells us that even before the diagnosis of diabetes, macrovascular complications have started and that could well be contributed with this mild but abnormality of postprandial glucose levels. And this is a CGM study which clearly shows us that postprandial hyperglycemia antecedates fasting hyperglycemia. And the fact that we were talking about the ill effects of postprandial hyperglycemia, there's a number of them, including problems in the lipid levels, the insulin resistance level, insulin secretion level, plaque stability, endothelial dysfunction, inflammation, and hypercoagulable states. Now, Hyperglycemia impairs immunity through several mechanisms, some of which are elucidated here. For paucity of time, I'm not going to talk about them. But what do guidelines tell us about postprandial hyperglycemia? If you look at all the international guidelines do tell you that postprandial blood glucose control is important and everybody has talked about varying targets though. And the ADA recommends that postprandial hyperglycemia adversely affects endothelial dysfunction. It is clear that it is like preprandial hyperglycemia contributes to elevated A1C. Its relative contribution being greater at HB1C levels that are closer to seven. And the targets for glycemic control must be individualized on the basis of individual clinical status. And postprandial testing is recommended for individuals who have PPBG values within target, but HB1C values above targets.
And it also states that measuring PPG one to two hours after the start of a meal is important and we have to have certain targets for it. And in terms of management, you have to talk about enteral nutritional therapy, particularly trying to cut down on the carbs or going for complex carbohydrates and breaking up the prolonged sedentary time may also encourage lowering of postprandial peaks. Monitoring dietary carbohydrates is important for improving postprandial glucose. And this is the IDF up after the ADA you can see. It also has similar guidelines saying that PPG raised is harmful and diet should be modified with low glycemic load food. And it talks about pharmacotherapy. And the IDF as it takes care of people living in the developing world is much more a rational body rather than the ADA and ESD, which is probably more driven by pharma. It talks about alpha glucositis as the first drug of choice for lowering postprandial glucose, followed by glenides, short acting sulfonylureas, short acting insulins, prandial insulins, premixed insulins. And of course, from the newer group, you can talk about the GLP ones and the DPP4. The fact that this guideline is a little old, they would probably have included SGLD2 inhibitors as well. And it does talk about checking glucose one to two hours after the meal and talks about of a lower target. The ADA talks about 180, IDF talks about a target of less than 160. And it encourages self-monitoring of glucose in the postprandial state. Our very own RSSDI talks about similar guidelines and emphasizes more on AGIs because of the dietary pattern and the reasons that I've already talked about. And it also talks about glenides and short-acting sulfonylureas for management of postprandial hyperglycemia. And what it does talk about also is combination therapy of AGI with other agents may be useful when considering control for postprandial glucose and SMBG is important. So again, is it really beneficial? When we know postprandial hyperglycemia is bad for us, but by lowering just postprandial hyperglycemia, does it translate into clinical benefits? That's a bigger question, which is not necessarily answered. But we as doctors, we believe in the best principles of belief that if something is causing harm, treating it and reversing it would probably lead to benefit. And these are the groups of drugs that we've already talked about. So why is combination required? Now, if you look at the UKPDS study, it was quite clear that after a while, whatever drug you used, the glycemic control did not last. So essentially telling us that we probably need more than one drug on board when we are trying to manage type two diabetes. And therefore, this as you can see is a, a, a step ladder approach wherein you've started one therapy, that therapy fails, and then you add another therapy. You wait for that to fail, and then add another therapy. Unfortunately, the inertia of up titrating or adding medication is there. Patient might be lost to follow up and therefore it's possibly quite wise to start multiple drugs or combination drugs together in the management of diabetes. So from shifting from the conventional active, uh, you know, conventional approach of failure approach and then making a change, what we would call a reactive approach. We need to have a proactive approach, just like the verified trial of metformin and vildagliptin shows that to start with, if you start with two drugs rather than one drug after the other, the therapy is sustained in terms of glucose monitoring for targets for a longer period of time. So we do realize that we have a problem and like I said, we have a problem wherein there is a loss of early phase of insulin secretion, followed by we need something else to cut down the postprandial peaks so that the glucose is absorbed slowly. And therefore, when you're thinking of that as a pathophysiological mechanism, you could probably think of repoglinide with Voglibos as a combination to try and tackle the two problems and the two issues that I've already talked about. So the first phase of insulin secretion problem and the insulin secretory problem can be tackled by repoglinide and the glucose absorptory problem of the latter phase of glucose absorption can probably be blunted by an AGI like Foglibose. The glenides, a quick recap of it, stimulate rapid but short-lived secretion of insulin from the pancreas and 
Therefore, there are the chances of a delayed postprandial hypoglycemia is re reduced. So if you compare a sulfonylurea with a glenide, the glenide would act very quickly, but stop acting after a while, unlike the sulfonylurea, which will start acting quickly, but will act for a much longer period of time, essentially telling us that more insulin will be released and there is a greater chance of a delayed hypoglycemia. So repoglinide is a molecule, which is a glenide, which has certain specific advantages. The action is glucose dependent. That means when there is glucose, only then is the insulin released. It elicits, elicits a very rapid, but a brief spot of insulin secretion. It is to be taken with meals for postprandial hyperglycemia. Does not have a delayed long lasting hypoglycemia. Possibly because it does not cause so much of insulin exhaustion, there might be some beta cell preservatory effect. Restores first phase of insulin secretion. And the side effects are similar to the other sulfonylureas and is recommended by various global bodies. So repoglinide exerts a direct action on the pancreatic beta cell. It does not act through the sulfonylurea receptor. Therefore, ischemic preconditioning of the myocardium is not hampered by repoglinide, as you can understand from a mechanistic point of view. It is glucose dependent insulin release, helps reducing glucose and postprandial hyperglycemia. I've already compared repoglinide with sulfonylureas. I've already told you it works on a different receptor, greater insulinotropic effect, more rapid onset of action greater stimulation of insulin release but for a shorter period of time and it is glucose and dose dependent insulinotropic effect. In terms of the efficacy and safety parameters as you can see repoglinide does probably better than natiglinide the other glinide and is probably more efficacious in terms of glucose lowering and therefore perhaps repoglinide is one this is one of the reasons why it's preferred over natiglinide. The metabolic parameters are significantly positive Insulin secretion post glucose excursion, very good. Cardiovascular, possibly neutral, if not possible, benefit. And this is a seminal paper that got published in the European Heart Journal. You will see people when they are giving talks of glycolazide, they usually pull up this slide and show that glycolazide amongst the sulfonylureas has, has the best cardiovascular outcome. But nobody talks about the bottom line in this forest plot, which clearly says that repoglinide is probably the best in terms of cardiovascular outcome other than insulin secretagogue like glycolazide. The other issue is that a significant proportion of our type 2 diabetic individuals have renal dysfunction. Repoglinide is a drug that's excreted through the feces predominantly and therefore this drug can be used in patients with chronic renal disease. What about Voglivos? It inhibits the absorption of carbohydrates from the intestine and its activity in terms of inhibitory effect on maltose and sucrose is almost 100 times more than miglitol and almost 200 to 300 times that of acarbose. And it reduces oxidative stress generation with the postprandial hyperglycemia. It lowers the glucose excursions postprandially and one of the other postulated mechanisms in animal model studies suggests that it might even increase GLP-1 levels and it has better side effect profile compared to perhaps the other alpha glucositis inhibitors. So here again, I've tried to summarize the beneficial effect of Voglivos and how it lowers postprandial hyperglycemia. So why repoglinide plus Voglivos? So we've talked about the two drugs individually. Now, one of the things is that the fixed drug combination always follows the law of therapeutic parsimony. And now what's that? Essentially, it tells us that you should probably be using the minimum amount of drugs to achieve maximum benefit. And to overcome high rates of failures of monotherapy and progression of complications, it's probably rational to combine the two together. One is an insulin secretion enhancer and the other is a glucose absorption reducer. Two different complementary mechanisms of action. One starting to act very quickly, immediately almost after having taken the meal and the other acting slowly as the food goes through the intestine. So 
it would seem that the combination is pretty rational. It provides better efficacy than monotherapy and provides very good primal glucose regulatory effect, modifies rapid insulin secretion and the molecules supplement each other. Now, when you put two drugs together, it's very important to know, are they pharmacokinetically com compatible? Is there any significant interaction when you put the two tablets together or the two molecules together? There is no clinically significant interaction in terms of pharmacokinetic interactions. And again, a summary, if you look, repoglinide bioavailability is good. Voglivose is very poorly absorbed. Most of the drug acts in the intestine and goes out through the intestine. And you can see there is a difference in the Tmax. Half-life of repoglinide particularly is very short. And elimination, as you can see, is through feces. That's the reason why it can probably be used in renal dysfunction. Talking about this fixed dose combination, this study was done and you know, it was presented to DCGI for approval. And I'll just quickly go through that study, the phase three trial. It's an open label parallel group study wherein you had a one is to one allocation of 200 odd patients. And you had two groups of individuals. Group A had the varying doses of the combination of repoglinide and voglivose. And group B had repoglinide alone. So you're combining repoglinide with voglivose in one arm and the control arm is repoglinide alone. And if you look at, that's the allocation, I'll, I'll skip that slide. If you look at the endpoints in terms of efficacy, you looked at HP1C fasting and postprandial glucose levels. And in terms of safety, you tried to look at all of the safety parameters that are of clinical relevance. And demographically, both groups were matched the repiglinide plus voglivose group versus the repiglinide group alone. And as you can see, the group that got the combination of repiglinide and voglivose had an additional 0.4% reduction of HB1C compared to the repiglinide group alone. So significant reduction in HB1C, significant reduction in the postprandial glucose levels in the combination, and it remained relatively stable over a period of time of 24 weeks in the study. And even the fasting glucose levels did much better with the repoglinide plus voglivose combination compared to the repoglinide alone. So in terms of all of the parameters of fasting, postprandial and HB1C, the combo did better. And if you look at the proportion of people who achieved glycemic targets, obviously the combo group achieved much better glycemic targets in terms of HP1C lowering. Body weight, there was no difference between the two arms, clearly telling us that the treatments were neutral as far as body weight is concerned. In terms of hypoglycemia, behold a surprise that actually the combination had less hypoglycemia compared to the group with repoglinite alone. Now, this might come as a surprise to some of you. As an endocrinologist, we often treat a lot of cases of spontaneous postprandial hypoglycemia with alpha glucositis inhibitors. Now, there is something called dumping syndrome in which the food passes much quicker than the insulin secretion. As a result, there is an asynchrony between the timing of the insulin secretion and the glucose absorption. In such a situation, alpha glucositis inhibitors actually reduce hypoglycemic events. And the reason probably why repoglinide and voglivose combination had lower hypoglycemia is probably two. First, the voglivose flattened the postprandial glucose absorption curve. As a result of which, the amount of insulin secretion requirement went down. So if the insulin secretion requirement goes down, the chances of hypoglycemia goes down. The second is we talked about Repoglinide is a drug which causes insulin secretion dependent on the glucose level. So if your glucose level went down because of the voglivose, you would secrete less insulin with the repoglinide and probably reduce the hypoglycemia. In terms of the safety parameters, there was nothing to choose between the two groups. Equal amount of side effects in both groups, both pretty safe. So in conclusion, fasting PPHB1C reduction was greater with the FDC. More proportion of people achieved HB1C reduction of more than 1%. Weight neutral, maybe initiated 
either as you know when you think that monotherapy is not going to benefit so again another study which is a fixed dose combination of repaglinide and voglevos a smaller study which again shows significant reduction of postprandial and fasting glucose without any weight gain and side effects of hypoglycemia so targeting postprandial hyperglycemia with fixed dose combination talking about another fixed dose combination an open label study from the western world showing that there is significant improvement in postprandial glucose levels with the combination so with all of that background let us now talk come to the final part of the presentation now as a clinician if you are going to use this drug where would you use the drug and what would be the dose so if you look at indication you would probably use it in type 2 diabetes as an adjunct to diet and exercise and in terms of the dose depending on your hb1c at baseline you would choose a combination of the two doses that are available in terms of method of administration should be taken before meal preprandially if you forget you can take it immediately after so dose should be taken immediately preceding the meal as to long as 30 minutes before the meal and if a patient skips a meal the patient does not take a tablet if a patient takes an additional meal he should take an additional tablet what about use in special situations in terms of renal impairment there is no need for dose adjustment in terms of liver disease you probably cannot use it in moderate to severe liver disease that's because the voglevos is contraindicated there you can use it in those above the age of 18 because we don't have data for pediatric dose and geriatric use starting the administration at a lower dose what about contraindications if there is hypersensitivity to any molecule don't use it in type 1 diabetes those with ketoacidosis those with severe liver dysfunction or those taking concomitantly gemfibrosil because repaglinide increases the blood levels of the gemfibrosil increases the blood levels of repaglinide too much to cause possible hypoglycemia if there is severe infection before or after operations or severe trauma and if somebody has gi problems special situations elderly patients in whom hypoglycemia is a concern you can use this drug starting with a low dose low dose individuals with renal dysfunction you can start this drug because you know it's safe patients taking low dose sulfonylurea who have hypoglycemia you can switch them over to this drug and particularly individuals who have irregular meal patterns because here as i told you take a meal take the drug skip a meal skip the drug so to summarize combination therapy of non sulfonylurea insulin secretagogue like repaglinide with voglevos will provide better efficacy in terms of glucose lowering compared to monotherapy both of them have different mechanisms of action and therefore the results will be synergistic there is no evidence of clinically significant pharmacokinetic drug interaction between repaglinide and voglevos combination was weight neutral and at fewer hypoglycemia events compared to monotherapy thank you very much hello hello dr sujay uh, there are couple of questions can i go ahead with the question sure 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 uh, the question from dr r k das can we add metformin also along with this combination surely because if you still look at the guidelines i'm not asking you to you know start therapy with repaglinide and voglevos as a combination most guideline except the european cardiological society guideline still says that after diet exercise and lifestyle modification the first drug that you start in an individual with diabetes is metformin and even the study that i showed you is actually on a backbone of metformin therapy that you have added this drug combination of voglevos with repaglinide surely you can add and what about gliptin in addition well mechanistically does there does not seem to be any reason why it will not work because the predominant mechanisms of action of gliptin is through increasing the incretin pathway now even though it's postulated that there might be some increase of glp1 through the voglevos but most of us would believe for example we are using the gliptins with sulfonylureas sometimes we use caution by reducing the dose of sulfonylurea before we start with a glip uh, start a gliptin 
but it it can be used at any phase of management of type 2 diabetes whether it's metformin or metformin plus a gliptin plus this combination or this combination and then an add on of a gliptin can be used and in most of the situations in my clinical practice i tend to use these groups of drugs as prandial glucose regulator because if we see patients who are much further down in the course of the disease in terms of beta cell dysfunction where maybe just you know giving one drug might not work therefore we are in the habit of prescribing multiple drugs in the management of type 2 diabetes there are couple of questions uh, oglibos and repaglenide a concern with many practitioner rather i believe oglibos and repaglenide both reduces uh, ppg can it lead to hypoglycemia but you showed in some clinical trials no. So we we need to look at what else is the individual on. Is this individual on say something like sulfonylurea? Then you would not use a repaglinide. Now the hypoglycemia, if at all, because you would be using it either with metformin, a DPP four inhibitor, or an SGLT two inhibitor. That is where you will use this drug. Now in that situation, it's the repaglinide only which can cause hypoglycemia. now you have an option of cutting down the dose of the repaglinide because you have different combina- doses combination so if you at all perceive that this individual is developing hypoglycemia switch over to a lower dose and if you still have hypoglycemia stop the repaglinide continue with the oglibos oglibos and repaglinide both reduce uh, ppg Right. there is nothing called the best drug or the worst drug in type 2 diabetes you know we we keep on fighting and for example right now the fight is about whether sglt2 inhibitors is the second line drug after metformin or whether it's even the first line drug or even the glp ones type 2 diabetes is a funny disease it's a lifelong disease and it's a progressive disease whatever you do with a patient in the management of type 2 diabetes with whatever drug you use if you look at the sequence of use of drugs you will have to go on using more than one two or three drugs at some point of time in the management of the diabetes so even if you're using just simple oglibos at some point of time even that's going to fail and even if you use repaglinide oglibos combination even that's going to fail at some point of time because the disease per se is progressive so you've got to understand that you know we are not talking about a panacea a fit for all kind of a magic bullet but we are talking about niche areas where you could use particular therapies for management for the best of your interest of your patients so the question like uh, if the patient is using insulin uh, maybe the basal insulin or the lente we don't know uh, can this combination uh, would be useful and can the dose of insulin would be reduced or can we reduce the dose of insulin right. i think there is one trial also very short trial which has shown that there is reduction in the insulin dosage when the patient is on this combination what should we take on that right so it would depend on you know what kind of insulin are we talking about is this individual only on a basal insulin and therefore you are trying to use this combo to manage postprandial hypoglycemia is this individual on say premixed insulin in the morning but that premixed insulin's short acting component is running out as he reaches say an afternoon or an evening snack there the combo will do well for example even in other situations where i am using you know premixed insulin twice a day you will find if you are using premixed insulin twice a day the worst blood glucose control is the pre dinner control with the premixed insulin in the morning post breakfast might be good post lunch might be good but the insulin has run out by the time he takes his afternoon or evening snack so you can add it with the afternoon or the evening snack so that the pre dinner sugar readings are relatively well controlled so the dictum that i would ask people to do is if somebody is on insulin at some point of time do a whole day snbg chart and see where the blood glucose is going up and according to the time that the blood glucose is going up try and modify the therapy in such a manner there you can use oglibos there you can use the combination like this to try and get the blood sugars down to normal now if you find that with the use of the premixed insulin you have uncontrolled postprandial hyperglycemia and yet have 
hypoglycemia before meals, you know that the previous insulin is not working. There you've got to go on to a basal bolus insulin. Now, if you're on a basal bolus insulin, then it does not make sense to add this tablet. Yeah, an interesting question again. Uh, if you compare it with sulfonylureas, how would you like glenide efficacy-wise? I, I, I think, I think my personal experience will tell me that they are less potent than the sulfonylureas in terms of the glucose lowering. But what is interesting and exciting to me is that, you know, it's because it's a mealtime prandial glucose regulator, my chances of having hypoglycemia is much less. So particularly individuals who have relatively smaller excursions of postprandial hyperglycemia. That means you are giving, say, for example, one milligram of glimepiride and the patient is having hypo. And when you're stopping it, the patient is having hyper. Glenides would be a fantastic drug to use. That's number one. Number two, individuals who have very erratic meal patterns. There I would use glenides rather than sulfonylureas. Again, for example, during Ramadan, when you're worried about hypoglycemia, you want a short-acting insulin secretagogue. This is a great drug. Okay. Uh, question from Dr. Sanjeev Banik. Uh, what about the... Would the gastrointestinal side effects of this combination therapy, can this combination be used in inflammatory bowel diseases? Maybe this is pertaining to ugly bowels because of its absorption. I think uh, I would not use it in an inflammatory bowel disease. But in terms of the GI side effects, the dictum that's there is that you start low, go slow, and you allow the stomach and the intestine to adjust to the GI side effects. However, most patients, you will see that after the second or the third week, their GI side effects will go down. And I showed in one of the slides that if you compare the GI side effects of Voglivos compared to the other AGIs, Voglivos probably does better. And finally, there will be a group of people who will not be able to tolerate this. So this group of drugs will then not be for them. Okay, again, uh, from Dr. Sanjeev Banik. One more question. If the PPG is not controlled with this combination, what would be the next drug used to control or manage right. PPG? Right. It, 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 it all depends. You know, you, I, I showed a whole list of drugs that reduce postprandial glucose. You can add a DPP-4 in it. You know, and, and depends on how, how widely away from the target it is. It could be an individual whose, whose postprandial glucose is still say, around 300 after the use of this drug. Even a DPV-4 will not work there. Then you've got to switch over to insulin. So it depends on the grade of postprandial hyperglycemia and it depends upon what else the individual is on in terms of the drugs. And of course, never forget dietary interventions often help. Smaller meals, more frequent meals, less carbohydrate loads will probably help. And a question from Dr. Subhash Kumar. Where do you see this combination in the future. Right. I think this is going to have a niche area. This is not something that you are going to prescribe to everybody with type 2 diabetes, but you will have these people where you, you have probably started a metformin, maybe given a DPP-4 also, wherein you know that the fasting target has come to somewhere close to what you want, but the postprandial is still out of control. You will use these as prandial glucose regulators. And intelligently, if we use these drugs, particularly with frequent blood glucose monitoring, if we decide upon using these drugs, these drugs will do well. Particularly in today's world, when people's lifestyles are so erratic, when you don't know whether you, when you're going to have the next meeting, you might not have time to have your next meal or the lunch. So there it probably is going to have a place. And another common query uh, is that, can this be prescribed twice daily or thrice daily but if you yes. look into the individual uh, monograms the, yes. it can be prescribed multiple times daily people have used this even four times a day and uh, again uh, again there are there were several questions when this was launched because it's three meal it should be given three meal when we talk about uh, repaglenide it's half an hour before the meal and then uh, if you talk about the ugly bows as per the product uh, monograph it's like first be a bite of the food so what would be an appropriate uh, time 
pre prandial what would be the minimum I, I, i would i would suggest immediately before the meal because it improves compliance you know the moment you tell somebody to take a drug half an hour before meal you know you taken a drug and you sitting there maybe even the food is there and you are having to wait you don't like drugs like that the best compromise at the start of the meal take a drug okay at the start of the meal with this combination also and the other question is like uh, what about in ckd which you have already covered uh, maximum dose of prepaglenide uh, please ask him i think i would go by the blood glucose readings rather than the maximum dose even even in say if you are using an insulin in ckd how do you go about uh, adjusting the dose you adjust the dose according to the blood glucose the this is i just wanted to ask you prepaglenide as a individual drug as a monotherapy this is approved by usfda but the combination with this alpha glucosidase inhibitor whether it is oblibosanol which is not approved and if you look into the literature also there are not uh, many literature so how would you like think the the, the reason i i stated during my talk was you know the alpha glucosidase inhibitors are drugs which are not popular in the western world at all and and that probably has something great to do with the dietary patterns and the gi tolerance patterns I think Indians tolerate AGI is much better than the Western one, and our diet is so very rich in carbohydrate that we do so very well with alpha glucosidase inhibitors. So why would anybody in the Western world even try to do a trial of that combination? Forget about you know approvals. Do we see any of the Western guidelines telling us that AGIs have a place in the management of type two diabetes? but does that mean that this group of drugs do not have any role in the management of type 2 diabetes it's just that we are very different and we as indians have to you know back ourselves and say you know i live in india we have an indian problem we have an indian solution yeah that's a very good uh, answer and the dr deena bandhu is asking is there any additional role of pioglitazone See, the mechanism through which pioglitazone acts the ppar gamma is predominantly the action is at the level of skeletal muscle and adipocyte even that with lower postprandial glucose levels so you can use any permutation and combination of the drugs that you want as long as you understand what stage the individual is in terms of the disease what is the agreed upon target of management and what are the associated comorbidities these are the three things predominantly that will decide which drug you use in which circumstances and uh, in the, this is like i just wanted to know can this combination be given in pre diabetic state because oglibos alone we have got several studies what about the combination prescribed i would probably not use it in pre diabetes because of the ripaglenide because we have glenide studies in the past you know you will remember which failed to end reach end points in pre diabetes studies it caused hypoglycemia and the the nateglinide and the repaglinide studies in pre diabetes did not result in positive results the voglevo study yes but repaglinide study no and uh, sir about type 1 diabetes you already covered but a question from dr kenil that any study of voglevo in type 1 diabetes there is so in terms of oglibos in type 1 diabetes even i use it for example like i said if this is someone who's having a basal bolus insulin three shots of short acting insulin and one you know long acting insulin and then again the child has a snack or the type 1 diabetic individual has a snack at some point of time and does not want to take another shot of insulin if it's a slow carbohydrate load relatively diet meal or snack that the individual takes i have used voglevos and there is some clinical data with regards to that as well interesting piece of information and uh, ckd i think we have covered that and uh, again a uh, question from can this be compared with the gliptin ripaglenide whether it is severe we don't have studies on that Or these two questions. That's it. I'm just I'm just screening for the yeah. questions.
compared to glimmer parade there is a question repair glenite versus glimmer parade how repair glenite can produce the same benefit what we got from the maybe probably they want to know the comparison between the glimmer parade and the right like like i said already i think as, as a clinician i would say repair glenite is less potent than glimmer parade but shorter acting quicker acting less of hypo and very very safe in kidney disease so repaglenide it is said that even in severe renal insufficiency also it can be uh, safely given can be so safe. any uh, in your practice do you this uh, adjust the dose of of repaglenide yeah right in in kidney disease See, essentially if you look at kidney disease and diabetes patients behave very very strangely it's not one you know homogeneous group of people there will be a group of people who don't need any anti diabetic medication at all in the stage of chronic kidney disease then there will be people who need a very mild kind of you know mild hyperglycemia there probably i would use a dpp4 inhibitor to manage the third group would be people who need something more beyond a dpp4 inhibitor there i would use repaglenide or even a short acting sulfonylureth the next group would be people who need insulin last group would be a group of people who have significantly severe fasting hyperglycemia who need very high doses of long acting insulin so you know it depending on what the glucose profile and pattern is in chronic kidney disease i would decide Uh, this question, I just wanted to know, like, how do, you, how will you position this combination? See, uh, a patient of uh, maybe uh, HbA1c of around seventy eight percent, then would you be starting with a metformin and then you would be adding on this combination? Where would you position this? Right. So essentially, as a clinician, I still am conservative in terms of first is diet and exercise. That's lifestyle measures. Second is metformin if not contraindicated. Now the third drug could be an SGLT2 inhibitor. Now after metformin could be SGLT2 inhibitor or a DPP4 inhibitor. If not affordable, would be something like a sulfonylurea or a glitazone. Now any of these situations that I'm talking about, if I have not used a sulfonylurea and if the postprandial glucose levels is slightly higher, I would probably go for this. If the sulfonylurea is contraindicated, I would go for this. And the fasting has been controlled relatively with whatever other drugs that I'm using, but the PP sugar is high. There probably I will look at the PP and see as how high is it. If it's mildly high, I'll probably go with the voglevers. But if I see that the fasting is very well controlled, but the postprandials are pretty high, I would go with this combination. and uh, one more uh, interesting question from dr samir panda there some patient have high fasting uh, plasma glucose and low postprandial and what's the reason behind it and how to manage right so you know it's not necessary that every patient will have similar fasting and postprandial glucose levels you have to understand the basic pathophysiology of diabetes one we do talk about insulin secretory defect but one of the major things is insulin resistance now where do we have insulin resistance in the body there are three major organs where we have insulin resistance one is the liver the other is skeletal muscle and the last is the adipocyte now you understand when you eat a meal and the blood glucose level normally should have gone up because the glucose get gets absorbed but it does not go up because the liver because the skeletal muscle and the adipocyte they take up the glucose in the post post meal state so if you have someone who's got predominant either insulin secretory defect or predominant problem at the level of adipocyte or skeletal muscle then the pp sugar will be high on the contrary in the fasting state where does the glucose come from in the blood it is from hepatic neoglucogenesis so if there is significantly high insulin resistance at the level of the liver you will find that the individual presents with high fasting glucose 
So in an individual, you might have differential levels of insulin resistance in the different organs. So an individual with high insulin resistance at the level of liver, but relatively near normal insulin resistance at the skeletal muscle and adipocyte will have predominantly high fasting blood glucose levels. And in such a situation, number one, investigate for NASH. Number two, use metformin predominantly at night because that suppresses fasting hyperglycemia. And if even that does not have, you know, take things into control, add a sulfonylurea at dinner time or a basal insulin. Three of these options, one of them will work. And uh, one more question from Dr. Mishra. Patient with only postprandial hyperglycemia, what would be the most preferable OH? Right, so I'm assuming this individual's fasting is absolutely normal yes. and his only the PP is high. Now, like I said, if it's mildly high, I would, first of all, modification of diet. Secondly, add an alpha glucosidase inhibitor. If it is still very high or if, uh, to start with itself, it was very high, start with this combo of glenide with AGI. And uh, uh, one more question, like... Uh, Acarbose is also there and there's Woglibose. So this, uh, there are some studies you know, Acarbose versus Woglibose. So in your practice, uh, do you prefer this Woglibose or uh, are both you are using them? Right. Uh, I'll answer that question in three different parts. First of all, I'll be honest about what my practice is. I probably prescribe much more of Woglibose rather than Acarbose. That's, that's answer number one. Answer number two, in terms of the data, I think Acarbose has even better data than Voglivos. Handheld on heart. But the reason probably we use Voglivos so much more in India compared to Acarbose, number one could be the GI side effect. And the more important reason it perhaps is market noise. Okay. Uh, I think so. We have we are done with the questions and uh, so uh, Pankaj, can we close? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Can we close? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, ma'am, sure. There are no other questions from your end, uh, PMT. If you have, like, I think uh, sir has answered most of the questions. If are very practically oriented. I I suppose uh, most of the questions sir has taken very well. And not only that, sir has made very clear that uh, all the PPG, PPSG has to be dealt with. And the same time, the, what is the power of ribaglinide? If definitely wherever the patient benefit is there. So thank you, sir. Uh, we thanks Dr. Sujay Bosu for his excellent and vibrant deliberation today, sir. And myself, Pankaj Kumar Patel, on behalf of Ajanta Pharma, I would like to thank all of our participants who have taken out their valuable time for today's uh, program. I would also like to thank all of our uh, field colleagues as well as uh, delegates who has come here for their uh, important time they have taken out. Sir, Ajanta Pharma is one of the leading uh, player in diabetology as well as in cardiology. And we have been launching the many First Time India brands. So I think our contributions are significant and we are very much uh, motivated with your support and participation here. And we'll continue to do, do the same thing. Once again, very much uh, thank you to all for your valuable time. And uh, my uh, sincere thank you for Dr. Veena also. And once again, Dr. Sujay goes. Thank you all. Thank you, very much. thank you Dr. Sujay. Good, good night. The question and answer were very well answered and all the practical things which were taken thank up very so well. And then we got to learn so many things. <laughs>